In November 1688, a fleet four times the size of the Spanish Armada set sail for England. Unlike its earlier counterpart, this Armada successfully made landfall at Torbay on the 5th, disembarking a 21,000 strong, well-trained Dutch army, supported by troops and resources from Germany and Scandinavia. At the head of this invasion force was William of Orange, de facto leader of the Dutch Republic, who, at the invitation of a group of supporters in the English Parliament, had come to seize the throne from James II. The king drew up his army to stop the invaders and Salisbury Plain, but facing a larger, better equipped force, abandoned the fight. As William approached London, he ordered the remaining English troops to withdraw to a minimum of 20 miles from the city, and for the next 18 months, Dutch soldiers occupied the English capital. Within four months of his landing, William and his wife Mary, daughter of James, had been proclaimed co-monarchs by a specially convened convention, Parliament, and James was forced into exile. The Dutch takeover was complete. How did this series of events come to be known as the Glorious Revolution? One in which the key instigators were seen as English parliamentarians and not the Dutch States General? How did an audacious Dutch bid to seize the English throne, so as to turn England's resources against France, come to be regarded as a primarily domestic struggle for the rights of Parliament? At the time, the Dutch and their English supporters were keen to stress that William and Mary had been invited to take the throne to defend English liberties and the Church of England from James II's absolutist vision of the crown and his Catholicism. Even before William and his army set sail in September, a Declaration of Reasons was published, eventually running to 21 editions. This condemned the evil councillors surrounding James and asserted the King's duty to protect the Protestant religion and the rights of Parliament. The Declaration one of many essentially arguing that James was guilty of misrule and stressing that William had been invited to seize power, was read from the pulpit of Exeter Cathedral on the first Sunday after the Dutch landing. As Jonathan Israel points out, such declarations and the maintenance of the Dutch army in Britain was deemed necessary by William to ensure the distinctly lukewarm attitude towards his arrival by sections of the English populace did not cause the revolution to falter and quite possibly collapse. Robin Eagles adds that William had been unimpressed by the very modest number of those willing to invite him to England, the so-called Immortal Seven, and then by the slow response to his invasion from those whom he expected to rally to his cause. If William was unimpressed, we can only imagine how James felt about his sudden loss of allies, including his own daughter, Anne. The collapse in his support certainly points to the importance of domestic politics in the change of regime. Even before his accession to the throne, James had been a divisive figure. His conversion to Catholicism, which became publicly known in 1673, had led to the exclusion crisis of 1679-81. to 81. During this crisis, three parliaments were dissolved to prevent the passage of an exclusion bill that would have seen James excluded from the line of succession, with the Whigs in favour of exclusion and Tories opposed. Two events in June 1688 had brought simmering discontent with the king's faith to the boil, resulting in rioting and attacks on Catholic chapels. The first was the birth of a son and heir, James, which threatened to create a Catholic dynasty with absolutist ambitions. The second was the prosecution of seven bishops for seditious libel, which was seen as an assault on the Church of England. It was against this backdrop that the immortal seven invited William to invade. The importance of domestic politics is also evident in the power of the 1689 Convention Parliament, which declared James had vacated his throne and then installed William and Mary as joint monarchs, so long as they agreed to its terms. The 1689 Bill of Rights placed limits on the power of the Crown, such as forbidding a standing army in peacetime, taxation or lawmaking without Parliament's consent. It also guaranteed free speech in and free elections to Parliament. As Edmund Rogers writes, the limits placed on royal finances by the Bill of Rights settled once and for all who had the power of the purse. Lois Schwara argues that these limits prove that the Glorious Revolution cannot simply be classified as a Dutch invasion where nothing changed but the nationality of the monarch. It was a real revolution that restored rights, 
and also created a new kingship.